Okay, thank you, Colin. Um, I've got to make sure that this is going to advance. Okay, perfect. Um, so I was here last year, and I gave an update on where we were at, and I made all sorts of crazy claims, like we would some, at some point in the future start shipping money. Um, it turns out that we are going to start shipping money very shortly. Uh, but first of all, I have to thank Ali Gorbani uh, in particular, because he gave up 15 minutes of his keynote um, so that I could actually uh, give you a, a bit of a report on where we're at with the NCC at this point. Okay, so I'm going to just walk through kind of what's happened over the last eight months or so fairly quickly. Uh, it felt a lot longer than eight months, but it was only eight months. And um, what we did was we managed to get our first call uh, for proposals out. Um, and that ran from April 20th to June 15th. And surprise, surprise, what Ashokan said about mobilizing Waterloo to put in lots of good applications, they did that. So that was, uh, that was really good. Uh, and also from UNB, we got quite a few applications. So there were multiple applications, and I mentioned that from each of the institutions. And I mentioned that because of some process stuff I'm going to talk about here in just a minute. Okay, uh, the scientific review committee was set up, and that occurred, uh, 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 they reviewed the documents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and by September 1, between June 16th and September 1, a ranking and a recommendation of those proposals had been formed by the scientific review committee. Um, unfortunately, the scientific review committee is not the uber fuhrer of all of this. They must actually go through an approval process, and so there's actually two levels of approval on this. One is with the National Cybersecurity Consortium's board, uh, and the other one is with the uh, federal government, specifically ICED. Um, all of that's been done now, uh, and so we are now entering the phase of results communication and government announcements are being planned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and ready for release. And I can say that all of the five founding directors of the NCC have been getting a fair amount of pressure about, well, when are we going to find out? Well, now I'm going to be able to tell you. Uh, High level, um, all three areas were represented in the applications that came in. So that's research and development, training, and commercialization. So it was great. We got applications from all three of the major areas. We also got applications across all five themes. And I'll give you a breakdown of, of, the, of, this, uh, of the actual results later, but I can't do it today because otherwise it would reveal some of the results, and I'm not allowed to do that just yet. Um, they, they did occur across all five of our themes, so that's network security, software security, privacy, human-centric cybersecurity, and critical infrastructure protection. And I can say unequivocally that all five themes have successful projects, as do all three of the uh, primary th areas that are represented at the top. So overall, I've got to say, I was pretty impressed with the quality of applications and the success. Uh, you're, you will be notified if you are an applicant um, on October 20th um, of this year. Some of you more cynical folks in the audience might think that this might take longer than that, but it will occur actually in about eight days. Uh, that will be embargoed, the notification. This is the way these things work. Uh, you get an embargoed notification. We notify successful and unsuccessful ones at the same time, um, and we're going to ask that that embargo be respected. It's critical to us uh, in terms of our credibility with the government. And don't forget, uh, the minister would like to be the one who's making all the splashy announcements and getting all the credit for this. Um, and since uh, they're a critical part of the funding, I'm more than willing to support this. However, on October 31st, everybody will know basically everything about what the results were, and, um, and at that point, we'll be entering the next phase of the process. And the next phase, of course, mostly impacts on successful applicants. Unsuccessful applicants will be uh, less engaged um, going forward, but there will be an ultimate recipient's agreement that needs to be struck. Uh, we'll start negotiating those on November 1. Um, a little different than what you're used to from NSERC or from SHRC. It's not like we're giving you money and then coming back later. 
there are KPIs and other kinds of performance indicators that need to be captured and also uh, uh, financial pieces that have to be put in place to, for when the money is getting drawn down and getting passed on to you. We've worked out most of the details for that. We've got all the forms ready to go. So we should be able to start that process on November 1. And as soon as you sign the URA, um, then the monies will start to flow and the projects can formally get started. There's a couple of other questions that people have asked me about this that if they come up here, I'm happy to answer. Uh, projects can start immediately, right as soon as you're notified, uh, but funds will only flow in conformance with the UR UFA. So I've been asked that a couple of times already. What if I start working on the project? are the eligible expenses. And we've determined that the eligible date to start charging is at the date of application. So if uh, the private sector, for example, partner has been making contributions, those contributions will count toward the uh, matching funds, for example. Uh, Post-award obligations will need to be met to ensure installments come to you. Uh, and uh, throughout the project and of course you have to be meeting the goals and KPIs. So this is not just curiosity driven research so it's not like a discovery grant where I'm going to work in privacy, oh AI looks really cool and I'll pivot and go work on that. So there are goals and milestones etc that are specified in the application process. <clears throat> so that's the next step in this process. Hopefully some of these projects can get started even before year end. Okay. Uh, we also established a membership model. Um, we told everybody last year that we were going to have members um, and the membership model needed to be defined yet. Uh, it has now been defined and approved through all levels. And so it's your, the membership for the ultimate, or, uh, ultimate recipient. Now remember, if you have a project from the University of Waterloo, you are not the ultimate recipient as a PI. The University of Waterloo is the ultimate recipient. So the membership obligation doesn't go to you, it goes to the organization. So it's the University of Waterloo. Um, <clears throat> two, two pieces around this. We've got a tiered base level. This is just base level membership fee, and it's based on the size of the organization, and it seems to be as fair as anything else. We want to make this as accessible as possible to as many organizations as possible, and we have value propositions, et cetera, for why you'd want to become a member, even if you don't receive funds. That's the base level. The second level is that anyone who is receiving funds from the NCC, um, uh, or from the CSEN uh, dollars, will then have a 3.5% membership bump at attach attached to that, which is called element, uh, element two of the membership model. Uh, this reflects who's getting the biggest reward and the need to cover off some operational costs for actually delivering the program. This has all been approved now and has gone through, and it's even been looked at by several VPRs. All of the applicant organizations have now been notified about this membership model and none have opposed it, okay? Uh, so, so far we've gotten nothing but positive feedback from this, so, so they understand that there's operational costs and this is part of the way we're covering off those operational costs. Okay. Um, all right, so we learned a few lessons from call one. Uh, and this is very high level, and I'm not going to dive too deeply into it, but um, we're going to change the application process. All of you who applied this time had an application process that required essentially that you submitted everything in stage one. It was a reasonable thing to do to start with because this was the first time we were doing it, but we learned from that that the right approach to this is probably a multi-stage process. So we'll probably do a, a letter of intent type process where we can kind of scope it and maybe I can have some conversations as a scientific director with multiple ones that are coming in that look similar so that we can get this pan-Canadian uh, ecosystem going a little bit better. Um, uh, so that'll be the first stage. Then there'll be a scientific or a scholarly or a content review of your actual proposal. So you'll be asked to submit a proposal that talks about the science of what it is you want to do or what the initiative is. And then assuming you make it through that phase and are recommended for potential funding, 
then we'll get all of the rest of the stuff, the national security stuff, the EDI components, all the rest of those components will come in. You won't actually officially get funds until you've gone through all three stages, but at least you will be making a proportionate investment to your likelihood of success in getting funds. So we're looking at sort of a two-pager to start with for the uh, letter of intent, a, a non-trivial document around the scientific component, and then the detailed work that's required in order to meet all the requirements. So in this way, we think it'll be a little bit more approachable by folks. That was one of the pieces of feedback I've received very clearly from the community. Too much work, too risky, don't want to do it. Don't want to put in all that work. So I know there were a lot of applications that didn't come in because they didn't have sufficient time to do that and we can clear that up. We also need to make it clear what's required around industry partners and the need for matching funds. The matching funds requirement are not on a per project basis, they are actually being done essentially on an ultimate recipient basis. The ultimate recipient might be the university, for example, and they can use uh, matching funds from one project to support another project. And the sense was from the community, the feedback I've gotten was that if you didn't have a dollar for every dollar that was coming in, it wasn't worth submitting, and that turned out to not be the case going forward. Um, this will become even clearer once you see the final results. Um, we also need clarification on the Spearhead R&D projects. Um, this is something different than a discovery grant proposal and we got some applications that came in that looked and felt a little bit too much like a discovery grant and not enough like an actual Spearhead R&D project that's supposed to be reflecting um, other values that were, that were expressed. And also the commercialization projects, um, they have to come in in a sensible kind of way with a specific task or goal that needs to be accomplished. Um, uh, simply saying I would like to commercialize my idea was insufficient. You needed to have a reason for, you need, for the funds and, and make a clear use of the funds. Okay, so that's essentially the content up to questions at this point. Um, the, the rest of the slides are essentially please follow us, pay attention to us, sign up for the email list, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know what this QR code will bring up, but who knows? I was reading about hacks to QR codes, so maybe you shouldn't scan it, but anyway, it's here if you want it. Uh, and with that, <laughs> with that, I will ask if there are...